Now we're going to delve into life in Asia for you in our weekly Asia View segment with our Beijing correspondent, Yenna Li. Yenna, uh, joining us there, uh, joining us from there. This week, uh, Yenna, a controversial deal is between the Vatican and Beijing, isn't it, on the appointment of uh, Chinese bishops. It's set to be renewed, isn't it? What's in the deal then? Well, we don't exactly know what's being negotiated behind closed doors, of course, but most analysts expect that we'll be seeing a renewal and a continuation of the current deal. Now, the original deal was first signed in 2018. It was renewed. It has been renewed every two years. And according to that, the Holy See and Chinese authorities are supposed to agree on the appointment of bishops. You see, before then, uh, they rejected each other's authority. Bishops appointed by uh, the Vatican weren't recognised by Beijing and vice versa. And this situation created de facto two different churches, one that's recognised by Chinese authorities and one that had to go a bit underground and stayed loyal to the Vatican. Critics of that 2018 deal described it as a sellout to Beijing. Some are very wary of Chinese authorities' attempts to Sinize the Catholic Church here and have more control over the estimated 12 million Catholic believers here. And since the original deal. There have also been some ups and downs. The Vatican has accused Beijing at least twice of making appointments unilaterally. But late uh, last August, authorities here recognised the Bishop of Tianjin, uh, Melchior Shi, who had previously been under house arrest for his religious activities. He was considered the leader of an underground church, but now he has been officially recognised. So it's a bit of a complex uh, story, as Beijing is, of course, no fan of religion, any religion. Yet this is also a diplomatic issue between two states. Uh, China is one of only a handful of countries alongside places like Afghanistan that has no diplomatic relations with the Vatican. And the Vatican has ties instead with a Taipei. The current deal has certainly uh, contributed to warming the ties between the two sides, as you'll see with this quote that I'm going to end on from Pope Francis himself last month during his tour in Asia. He said, I respect China. It's a country with a millennial cu culture with a capacity for dialogue and understanding that goes beyond other systems of democracy. Well, let's move from uh, religion now to tourism. Beijing is pushing for more foreign tourists, isn't it? But for one group of visitors, things didn't quite go as planned because of uh, the way they dress, and it sparked some debate on social media there. Absolutely. A group of uh, foreign fashion designers were visiting Beijing and they queued up to enter the Forbidden City, that 15th century imperial palace complex in the heart of the capital. But they were turned away. The uh, duo known as Fecal Matter later wrote on Instagram that security told them to remove their makeup and change into quote unquote normal clothes. And they described the experience as humiliating and dehumanizing. This incident sparked a bit of a debate online and state media here has even commented on it. Some argue that the freedom of dressing as one would like should be uh, respected. Others, though, say that local history um, and culture should be respected, especially in the context of uh, the Forbidden City. Let me bring up some um, comments that we've seen online on Weibo, the Chinese social media platform, for you. One a user said, I don't mind, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think it's necessary to deny uh, entry to museums or any historical sites in any country. Um, Another, though, writes, although I like the designer Rick Owens, this is indeed disrespectful. Every place has its own dress code. As for the actual dress code, well, the Forbidden City's visitor guide states that clothes have to be neat and tidy, but that's really up to interpretation. And, well, we could conclude, though, that this historical site is perhaps not the most welcoming of places for the type of artists who visited and were turned away. They're the type of artists who really do push the boundaries of self expression. And we're going to end, in fact, with uh, a TV show. It is topping the charts across Asia, isn't it, Yeno? Yeah, it's another Korean one. Tell me, though, is it as violent or tell me it's not as violent as Squid Game? It's not as violent as Squid Game at all, Stuart. It's called Culinary Class Wars, and it's a cooking competition show that starts out with 100 contestants. Um, it hit the number one spot uh, on the streaming platform Netflix in South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and in Singapore. It was also the top non-English language show on the platform worldwide after its release. And this 
for three consecutive weeks. It's no secret that um, South Korean films and television shows have become more and more popular of late. There are a lot of genres, there are rom-coms, there are the, the violent uh, revenge stories. And now reality TV too is gaining some traction. Added to this, Korean cuisine has become somewhat of a cultural export in its own right. One research institute estimates that six in ten Global consumers have visited at least one Korean restaurant outside Korea in the past year. Um, and although the chefs on this TV show don't necessarily cook <laughs> uh, traditional Korean dishes, it does appear that the concept of a Korean cooking show with cliffhangers and surprises has been a recipe for success. So far, the show has been renewed for a second season. I, if we're into cooking shows, Stuart, this one might be something you'd like to watch. It looks interesting, doesn't it? It could be violence, though. With wooden spoons and kitchen knives, you never know, Yenna. Yenna Lee there, a correspondent uh, joining us from Beijing. Thanks very much.